Thanks for tuning in. I am Lynn Berger, host of Lynn Berger Interviews Remarkable People. And today I have the pleasure of speaking with L.A. Williams, programming and production professional and the Harlem Connection radio show executive producer and co-host. Thank you so much for being here today. I am honored to be here for the consideration. Great. We're going to have a good time. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> so take me back to your earlier education and career, and we're going to go through it and let the audience hear about the changes you made and why you made the decisions you did. Okay. Uh, so free education, I, uh, I was a comic book lover, mm. um, and my and pre me being born, my family uh, on my father's side moved to Harlem in the year 1919, right? So uh, I grew up and my cousin introduced me to comic books when I was a little kid and loved comic books throughout my entire life. Uh, I went away to college and I was a African-American studies major. And when senior year approached, we had to do a hundred page senior thesis on something African-American history related. And I had these incredible teachers. Uh, Michael Thelwell had marched in the civil rights movement. He was friends with Stokely, Stokely Carmichael. I had a music professor, Archie Shepp, who was a world renowned jazz musician, et cetera. And I was like, what the heck can I write about history that these guys don't know? Have mm -hmm. an and then I thought, well, in fact, what can I write about anything that these guys wouldn't know, you know other than maybe comic books? And, you know, and then I kind of was like, wait a minute. So I wrote my senior thesis in college on the history of black characters in superhero comics and what those characters reflected about the times in which they were created. Wow. Essentially, the premise was that if you didn't know what year a comic was produced, but you knew history, if you picked up a comic book, you could kind of tell what was happening politically, socially, uh, what movies were popular, what clothing styles were popular, et cetera, just by taking a look and because the comics are art and they mm -hmm. reflect the times in which they are created. So 60s comics and 60s characters look very different from the comics and the characters from now, even if they're the same basic structure. So that was my senior thesis in college. Um, How'd you do on it? I, I did well, <laughs> I did well. I did, uh, and even better, uh, after college, I needed to get a job, and, it, and I completely lucked out. The same cousin who had got me to, into comic books was at a party, and he met the president of DC Comics. Oh, that's a great story. So my cousin is advocating for me, like, oh, my, my cousin would love to work for you guys. And she was very gracious, and like, well, you know, if he has experience, he should mm -hmm. send his resume. And my cousin said, well, he doesn't have experience because he's just finishing college. And she, he said, but he did this 100-page senior thesis. And she said, tell him to send me the thesis. <laughs> so I sent her the thesis. And that led me to my first job after college Your at dream DC College. I should say yeah. that. Yeah. And I think the reason that I think it's important what I want other people to kind of get from this, especially young people who are mm -hmm. in high school or college, is essentially your resume is basically just comes down to with, with the time you had. Mm -hmm. How have you spent the time that Absolutely. makes you qualified for consideration for this job? And I had no idea of knowing that doing that work was going to lead to, you know, certainly wasn't a plan, but she was able to see, okay, well, with the time he's had, he took advantage of that time to learn more about the industry. And I think that's something that can be replicated, i.e., uh, there are so many different ways when you're in school to become far more familiar with whatever the topic is that is your passion. Mm. 
And I think a lot of times when people go to college or when they're in high school, or what mm -hmm. have you, they don't think about what it is that everyone, you know, I always say like, hey, unless your parents are super rich or you hit mega millions, you're going to have to work. Ideally, you're going to want to do work that you love doing. And if you're fortunate. Yeah. That well, that's what well, you created. it. Well, I think what happens is sometimes we don't realize that some of the things that we love and enjoy are actually mm -hmm. professions. So I was so busy as a comic book lover and fan that I wasn't thinking like, oh, wait, but people get paid. To oh, do this, people right? get paid doing a lot of things, if you think about exactly. it. Exactly. So that led to my job at DC Comics, where I became an editor. But I got the job at DC. I was eventually given a comic to edit, and I was given one of their worst selling comics, right? <laughs> and I was like, well, let's see what you do with this. Like, yeah. you know, like, Chances for job advancement were kind of contingent on how did I do with this comic that I had. Only problem was it was a really, really low selling comic that was about to get canceled. Oh. But it was a comic that I loved before it, uh, when it first came out. I was like, I loved the comic. And then some over the years, it kind of gone a different direction. And uh, and I was like, OK, how do I bring the oomph back? How do I mm -hmm. if I can bring back the oomph and so I brought, so as a comic book editor, you are responsible for either hiring or managing or both the creative team that makes the comics. Mm -hmm. So that is the writer, the penciler, the inker, the letterer, the colorist, and you put them all together and you share the vision and they, and you know, they kind of work as a team, produce one comic and the next and the next. And you use the kind of judgment that says, well, if I'm doing a funny comic, I need a writer who can write comedy. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing something dark and serious like Batman, then I need someone who can do action and brooding and what have you. So I helped to put together a new team. But then my problem was, how do I get people to, because since the comic had been selling for so long, mm. how do I get people to start buying the comic again? New readers and old readers to come back. So I went to the marketing team and said, hey, listen, you know, I'm revamping the book. This is going to be really good. Like, help me. Mo and they're like, well, you know, this book is about to get canceled. And we like, we're not going to spend the money on that. So I was like, well, OK, but what can we do to promote it that doesn't cost money? Mm -hmm. And the answer was, well, that would cost time and energy. So I'm like, OK, well, what would you do? Well, we would do press releases and we would try to get some media attention. And I was like, well, OK, well, how do you write a press release? Right now, that's not my job as the editor. My job as the editor is to make sure there's no mistakes in the book, that the creative team is the right team, the, the tone and the vision and the direction. Of, but no point in doing that if the book is about to be canceled. So with that, I basically kind of learned how to market the book. So I'm like writing Fantastic. press releases and I'm doing all this kind of stuff with them. So I basically, okay, statute of limitations has happened a long time ago. So I would basically like write a press release and then go to like the team and be like, hey, well, what about this? Does this work? And mm -hmm. they're like, well, we'll tweak it. And then they, because it wasn't extra work on their part because it was already written. And I helped to generate press for the book, which helped to save the book and uh and eventually we quintupled the sales oh, so great. what a success story. so that was a lot of fun and a great opportunity and that was my first job out of college uh but during college and in high school i used to work for the harlem week festival here in the mm -hmm. city uh that was like my summer job uh, and when it was time for me to look for something else to do once I was leaving DC Comics. I was thinking a lot about, well, how could I give back to Harlem Week? Like, what could I do? Uh, and at that point, I started thinking Harlem Week was a lot like the comic I was editing, that it had some really great, it had a great structure, but it needed some new marketing and a way to kind of promote mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and some new tools to help promote. And so I went to the Harlem Week team and said, look, here's some things I've learned from working at DC Comics. I would like to help you guys out for the summer, uh, for the upcoming Harlem Week. 
and I got hired to do that. And then that ended up lasting for, I think, about six and a half years or so. So I thought it was just going to be that one summer. Uh, and what I learned was, you know, some of the skills that I learned at the comm company were transferable. So with Harlem Week, Harlem Week is a summer festival here in the city mm -hmm. for those who are unfamiliar where it's basketball tournaments and movies and concerts and senior citizens day uh, events and children's festival and there's just so so much to Harlem week and I got to work and plan and work on Harlem week and I did that for years and, and then you thought it was only going to be the summer I thought it was going to be one summer uh, little did I know mm -hmm. and from there I ended up uh, working for the Apollo Theater. So I went from production for Harlem Week to eventually doing production for the Apollo Theater for their community programs department. The, wow. Uh, and so I worked at the Apollo for, for over 15 years producing community oriented events uh, based on the things I learned from Harlem Week. And now I am the producer, as you mentioned earlier, of a radio show called The Harlem Connection. And essentially, I took a lot of the things that I learned from the Apollo and my overall love of music and my love of trivia. Mm -hmm. And so we have a weekly radio show, mm -hmm. uh, me and two friends, and we are on WBAI and RhythmAndSoulRadio.com. So we're on two stations right now. And the hook of the show is we play music from every genre, every decade, with one caveat, which is every song that we play somehow has to have a connection to Harlem. Mm -hmm. And so the way we define that is the artist or the songwriter or the producer has to either be from Harlem or have gone to school in Harlem or lived in Harlem or performed somewhere in Harlem. And so we have the advantage of having, I like to think, a really fun radio show and a, with a eclectic, diverse um, genres of music, but also use that as an opportunity to brag about and talk about and promote places in Harlem, uh, the restaurants, the theaters, uh, the libraries, and the really cool people and leaders who live and work uptown. And What a great progression and very original, very creative. What would you say is the theme through all the positions you've held to date? Uh, well, I mean, kind of doing a plug here. <laughs> They're all connected because uh, I think there were things that, whether they were in life that I had learned, mm -hmm. uh, again, because my family had been here since 1919, there were so many things that I knew about Harlem uh, because I've been reading comics since I was like around four years old. There were so many things I knew about comic mm -hmm. books. Being able to kind of have a little faith in the things that I already knew and saying, hey, okay, I know this, I can learn this, but I already come knowing that. I think the other thing was understanding how for lack of a better term, things connect. Um, how skills can be transferable, even if you don't necessarily see it. So for example, at the Apollo, people kind of think like, okay, how did you go from working in comic books to working at the Apollo Theater? It's like two totally different well, things. Well, there was something in between. Right, well, there was yeah. Harlem Week in between yes. where I got to do production, but what they had in common is they were actually way more similar than you would think. With comic books, you have to have a script. You have to kind of plot out the script, who's speaking mm -hmm. first, who's mm -hmm. speaking second, mm -hmm. what have you. When I was working at the Apollo, I would have the script, what the MC would say, or on occasion, what some of our uh, Apollo uh, representatives, the executive producer or the president was gonna say when she came on stage. So being able to write and deal with scripts was an important aspect of, of it. Another thing was producing. So at the comic book company, I'm thinking, okay, we're going to be doing this issue featuring Wonder Woman. So I need to make sure that I have somebody who can understand and write 
uh, a strong, great female mm -hmm. character. I need someone who can draw a really gorgeous woman, et cetera. And you kind of put that team together. You, you have to have the right writer with the right artist, with the right colorist, what have you. At the Apollo, I would say, okay, if we want to have a panel discussion about this, who would be a great moderator? Mm -hmm. Who would be a good panelist? Who would be another panelist who would complement panelist one? Who would be another panelist who would be an opposing voice to those two panelists that where it can be a productive conversation and not antagonistic? Uh, if I was producing a concert, I have to think, okay, well, who's gonna be the opening act? Who's gonna be a middle act? Who's gonna be the closing act? And with the radio show, we don't just kind of throw music together. We have to actually think, okay, well, we're gonna open the show with this song, and then we're gonna segue mm -hmm. into that song, and these are how the songs connect, et cetera. And so, no matter what the job is, has been, mm -hmm. I've always been able to take something that I learned from the prior job and then kind of say, okay, well, this is what I'm now going to bring mm -hmm. to the next job. Uh, and so I think that's kind of what the connecting threads would be. And I, and I share that not so much, um, I mean, I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk about me and what I do, but I'm really saying that more because I think sometimes uh, people who are looking for work, who are trying to figure out what career is, sometimes they limit themselves, mm, of right? And I want people to kind of look and think to themselves like but what what do i bring to the table because the reality is that you know i had never worked at a comic book mm -hmm. company mm -hmm. until i worked mm -hmm. at a comic book company and there is a way to kind of look and see how what you already know can be useful to the next uh employer or the next uh, journey on your career path, for lack of a better term. But what you did was, it wasn't only identifying the value you can give them, you chose things that you really like to do. It seems that each of those positions allowed you to really focus in on the skills you have and the skills you really like. You brought yourself there to each of those experiences. I've been fortunate to have dream jobs uh, no matter how much you love a job, it means you're taking time away from your family or your friends or something else you mm -hmm. could be doing. And so I've always wanted to have a job where it was something that I love doing and that if I didn't have to pay the bills, this would be something that I'd be perfectly willing to do for free. I did have one experience when I was a teenager where I had a job that I hated, hated that job. And it made it clear like, okay, like do something that you really, really will enjoy doing and that you're passionate about. And I've been very fortunate in that aspect. Now I'm gonna ask you a very hard question. Okay. But when you look back at the things you've done, what has been like your proudest moment? Can you come back to that? Hmm. I'm not sure I have a proudest moment. I know that there are things I am proud of. With the comic book company, uh, with working at DC Comics, I was proud to be able to give opportunities to artists who I don't think they would have had opportunities or they might not have had them had I not been able to hire them. Mm -hmm. I was not quick to say, I certainly worked with some established writers and artists, but I also felt very fortunate that someone had given me a chance and was always eager to kind of give chances to others. And there are artists and creatives who are still in comics to this day, and I'm really proud that when I go to the comic book store and I buy comic books that I see comics produced by people who I hope to bring into the oh. industry. So that, I think out of all the things I did there, that's what I was, you know, so it wasn't necessarily a one moment. With, um, with Harlem Week, uh, I, I feel like I played a part in terms of giving it a little bit new energy and helping to bring on uh, sponsors and supporters and just kind of giving the board and others ways of 
of just kind of feeling a little bit more revitalized and, and knowing that some of the, the a youngster who helped gr who grew up in the ranks was willing to kind of come back and give back. And at the Apollo, what I was most proud of was the Apollo is known all over the world, right? right? People come from all over the world to come to the Apollo Theater, but it is a New York institution, and New Yorkers are not particularly known for saying, hey, let's hang out where the tourists go, right? <laughs> uh, I think what I was proud of at the Apollo was making sure that we connected to Harlem and to New York City to make sure that New Yorkers felt that what we were doing was relevant to them. Mm -hmm. And to, it was, I was proud to see um, audience members come to the Apollo who lived in New York, who grew up in New York, but who had never been to the Apollo before. Mm. And with the radio show, what I really love about the show is if you walk the streets of Harlem for 20 minutes, you're going to hear about six different music genres. This car is going to be passing by playing hip hop. Out of the window, this house, this apartment is playing James Brown. When you walk down here, you're going to hear salsa, et cetera. And it all works. It helps make Harlem Harlem. Uh, I grew up in an area, in an era, I should say, when I turned on the radio where uh, the DJs played all those different genres. Mm -hmm. But nowadays with Spotify and people can kind of customize their own listening experiences, and also nowadays when you turn on the radio, this station plays hip hop and R&B. That's all they play. This station plays jazz. That's all they play. And I love being able to do a show where we play a little bit of everything in a way that is seamless and connects. And you're not sitting there going like, wait, why are they going from here to here? Because we're showing you on the show how the music connects, how the community connects. And I love being able to show how special my community is. Again, we play the amount of music, the diversity of music that we play on that show every two mm -hmm. hours, every Friday night is immense. And I would say, I don't think you could do the same show with any other community and have it be as diverse and cool and fun. Uh, I think, frankly, you'd be hard pressed to pick a lot of other cities to do, mm -hmm. but certainly to just pick a neighborhood where you can play Paul McCartney, you can play uh, LL Cool J, you can play Billie Holiday, you can play Tito Puente, Aretha Franklin, and uh, Bruno Mars, and except, like the fact that all of these people have come to Harlem and many of them got their careers launched in Harlem, to be able to celebrate that on a weekly basis uh, is something that I am particularly proud of. Uh, and so I invite people to come oh, and, yeah, and, and, and join and, and listen. Yes. In fact, thank yes, you for yeah, listening. Yes, I, I listened last week for Father Halloween show. Yeah, I appreciate that. It was that. fun. It was a lot of fun. So we only have a few more minutes now. I'd love to hear from you you seem to always come up with something more interesting than the thing before. Where do you, what's next for you? What new projects? You know, I thank you for saying that. What I think I've done though is for most of the projects I've been on, I, I feel like I've had some degree of longevity and helping to build and grow them. So the Harlem Connection, we are celebrating our second anniversary and I've got a lot more I want to do with this. I want to expand the listenership. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're watching this show, tell others we're on Friday nights on WBAI mm -hmm. uh, at 10 o'clock. We are also on rhythmandsoulradio.com. I want more listeners to mm -hmm. tune in. I would like to be on more stations and I would like to grow the show so that uh, people all over the country and beyond are listening going like, wow, Harlem's pretty cool. I want to use the Harlem Connection as a platform so that people who live in New York and in Harlem in particular are more excited and treasure the community more. And for outsiders who 
I want more of them to say, you know what, wow, I've got to come visit there because <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm hoping for, I'm sharing. And I love to get feedback. So again, Twitter at Harlem Connect FM, Facebook, The Harlem Connection, Instagram, The Harlem Connection, and our email is The Harlem Connection at WBAI.org. <laughs> so every week we try to come at it with a different theme, different direction. Do you have a brainstorming session to come up with these ideas or? Oh, sure. My, my, my friends, I've got uh, my colleagues, Mama Soul and DJ Black Icon One, and they are super musically knowledgeable, but they're also very uh, funny folks and very creative folks. And th so it is a collaboration of, okay, what are we gonna do this week? Uh, and they also help to offset uh, we all have strengths and weaknesses musically. Mm -hmm. And part of what we like to do with this show is to make sure that it is a showcase for independent artists. A big part of it is to help promote what is so great about our community. Well, it seems that you've promoted in your comics, you promoted some artists, and you came back to that now, promoting artists. Uh, we all get here because somebody helps us, and that's, uh, that's what I love to do. Well. You've done a very nice job, and you thank you so much for being here really, today. Really, thank you, and I really hope that folks will feel my enthusiasm, tune into the show, and go, oh, that's why he's excited about this show, and that they'll share it with their friends. But I, 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 think, I think we got something, <laughs> so let, let's see what happens. Well, your enthusiasm clearly comes through, and it was a pleasure to speak with you. And I look forward to hearing more about your future projects. Good. Thank you for tuning in today. It was a great show. We learned a lot about L.A. Williams' career and how he was so creative and original and how he, there's a thread through each of these positions and how he not only went to work every day and does his projects, but is always there wanting to help and promote others. Thank you.